Christmas, Christ Jesus. <coughs> if we don't have this mindset of having Christ and defining our, letting Him define who we are, and having our citizenship, realizing that our citizenship is, is defined in the heavens, then it goes back to this whole idea of our gospel message has been destroyed here on earth. Amen. We have no gospel message because we've shown it all to be fake. We've shown it all to be weak. Our enemy is not each other. Our enemy is Satan. Because at one point, we were all enemies of Christ ourselves until we were at the we were enmity. We were enemies of Christ until we actually accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior. Now we're on a new team. We're on a team that cannot and will not lose. And that same joy that we have now is the same joy we need to be telling others. But we all are connected together. The next thing is, is to strive. What are you striving for? Striving together, and we're still at that verse number 27, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Striving together means to, to labor at the same time. It doesn't mean I labor over here, you labor over here, you labor over here, we labor over here. No, we are all laboring together. One goal in mind. We all labor together and we come along one side and we help each other out. It doesn't mean that I've got my ministry over here, so this is just my ministry and you can't help me. I got it. I can deal with it. You've got your ministry over here. I got this. I'm, you're fine. I'm fine. It's not you have your ministry over here. No, no, no. We're all striving together, laboring together, existing with one mind, all rooted in Christ Jesus. The faith of the gospel means that we earnestly agonize. It means you earnestly. You know, have ever been like you, you haven't eaten for quite a while and then you, you, you really start thinking about that, that meal that you know is waiting for you when you get home and you, you're on 95 and you may be stuck in traffic, but you earnestly are agonizing. I can't wait till I get home to get that meal or to see someone, your loved one. But that, that's the same thing. You earnestly Agonize, and, and you're standing firm, but you want you, you want this very, very bad, and you're not going to let anything or anybody alter you from going the course. You're not going to look to the left or to the right. Look straight ahead. We stay in our house like, stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. This faith of the gospel means, like I said, you're standing strong. You're earnestly agonizing for the body of of truth, which is the gospel message, once and for all, and, and you're not adding to it or subtracting from it. It's the gospel message. It's strong enough to stand on its own. Don't add to it. Don't detract from it. Jude. Well, it's only well, I want to say one three, but really it's Jude three. I mean, there's only one chapter, <laughs> but it's, it, it reads, beloved. When I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you, to encourage you, that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to you, unto you by the saints. Now, if you go further on and you read in, this, in these verses that we read, you realize that Paul was actually saying, and he realized that this gospel message was a privilege. This is not something that, this, this book is not something that you just, you just come in and you just toss it to the side and, and you, but then you say you, this is who you love, this is, this is what you live by, but you, you, do you really live by it if it's sitting in the back corner? Do you really love it if you put it back here and you really don't know it, but you know every channel that your favorite shows come on? And you can quote some of the lines of your favorite movies. Which one is it? Which one is it? But he counted this gospel message. And here's the thing. This is why he counted this gospel. Because Paul realized what the power that this message had. Because he not only did he, he didn't have to look at everyone else. First of all, he had just, just look at myself. And he's given us more than one testimony through scriptures of where he was before Christ and what the power of this gospel message is, how it changed his life. 
So then he actually sees how it's changed his life. And now he actually starts to go out and he starts to tell others. And other people come to, to see it and embrace it. And now he's seeing how it's changed their life. So now that's how the word of God is actually going out. That's the privilege. That's what he's talking about. This is a gift. It is a gift of God. And that's how we have to, that's how we have to look at this gospel. This is a special, special thing Amen. that God has given us. And it's all embodied in his son. Christ Jesus. Every Christian is an important member of the team and is needed to extend the gospel. All of us are needed to extend the gospel message. I mean, we all have unique talents and abilities that God has given us, not for us to use them for our own selfish ambitions, but to use them to further spread the gospel. One of the funny things, and it irks me all the time, is when I actually... And it bothers me, maybe it's just personal, but when I hear people who actually, you know, stars who blow up and everything, and the singers, and they, they say that, um, they go back and they sit down with them and they talk to them, well, where'd you get your start? I got my start in the church. I was singing in the choir, and I was doing this in the church, and then in the church. And why'd you leave? Why'd you leave? If that's where you got your roots, and God gave you that talent, and he gave you the talent and the abilities, and, and you actually were singing of the praises of God then why'd you leave? It's really because you saw over here the glitz, the glamour, and, and the fame, and you allowed that to now define who you were. What is our true nature? If we just say, yes, we love God, and we say that on Sunday or Monday or Tuesday, but then on the the rest of the week, the rest of the week we go off and we start to, we start to labor in the world, then what's our true nature? Are we strengthening ourselves? Are we trying to strengthen ourselves? Or is our nature more rooted and our citizenship more rooted in the world? And as God starts to strip that stuff away from you, you start to see, just like he did for me, I had to start to see who I really was. At the very core of who I really was. The bickering the backbiting, the selfish ambitions, if we are all of one mind, rooted in Christ Jesus, we are all citizens of Christ, and that's who we are finding our identity in, then you can't have bickering, you can't have backbiting, you can't have selfish ambitions. Because last time I read, I don't remember reading any of that. In, I haven't, I'm not going to call myself a scholar, but I have yet to come across a verse where I hear Christ saying it's okay to backbite, to bicker, to have your own selfish ambitions. Amen. Amen. Last, to suffer. This idea of suffer. For unto you it is given on behalf, and this goes down to verse number 29. For unto you it is given on the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Suffer for his sake means to, to undergo or to experience persecutions or tribulations for the sake of Jesus Christ. For the sake of the righteousness of Christ, found in Christ, in Christ alone. God has given us the privilege, and we have to count it as a privilege to believe on him, but also to, to suffer for him. To suffer for him. 1 Timothy, excuse me, 2 Timothy 2.12. 2 Timothy 2.12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. We have to honor our suffering with Christ and for Christ. We have to we have the honor of suffering for Christ and, and re really with Christ. Amen. Then you go on. You don't have to turn on these. If you want to jot them down, you can. Then you go to 2 Timothy 3.12, and it says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Christ suffered to provide us salvation. We find that in Romans 5, 8. But God commended his love towards us. For yet, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Then it goes on. For our affliction, which is but a mo for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. In Christ Jesus. Again. The unity. There was, um, when I was with the kids, we went on a march for life. And the march of life was actually in D.C. And so, you know, you've got 
First of all, I was impressed because you have a lot of teenagers who were willing to actually go to this march of life. And, and they went on this march of life, and the day we went on there, it was actually, it was, it was a cold day. It was a cold day, and it was a wet, and it was a rainy day. But yet you still had these kids who actually had this, this one spirit that even though, yeah, physically I'm not feeling my best because of, it's cold out here, but yet at the same point I realize that th there's a higher thing that I'm actually here. There's a higher reason why I'm actually here. I I'm standing here because God's principles tells us about abortion. And, and I don't believe in it, so I'm willing to actually sacrifice my own time. I'm willing to actually sacrifice me being a little cold and getting a little wet for being for, for actually Christ. Amen. That's an example of, of letting Christ define your citizenship, Amen. whose you are. Because it's, it's defining what you're going to do with your life here on earth. So when we wrap it up, Philippians... Chapter 1, verse 12. But I, and this is Paul talking once again, but I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happen unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. As undesirable and as unpleasant our circumstances of life may be, we have to believe that God has designed them for the uplifting of the gospel of Christ. Amen. As believers in Jesus Christ, our identity has to be defined in Christ and Christ alone. And our identity has to be show to non-believers that our identity is in Christ. So then they see the power of this gospel message lived out. So now, as we tell them of the gospel message, we can honestly say that it has changed our lives. And they can see that it has honestly changed our lives because they've looked at us. And they see a change. We are now, and this goes back, and I think Pastor spoke of this, we, we are now looking at the church and the kingdom building now being a distractor to the world's priorities instead of the opposite. We're looking at the world. We're looking at the church and the gospel message now being a distraction from how we really want to live our life, which is in the world. Bottom line. It has to stop. If we're going to call ourselves and say that we are rooted in Christ and we're going to define our citizenship in Christ, then that means we have to be all about Christ. We have to live and breathe Christ and Christ alone. Amen. 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 I don't think you really hear a more powerful sermon. No. It's uh, very, very powerful. And, uh, thank you. Let's give Brother Minister Tom Morell another round of applause. And then uh, uh, we can all bow our heads. Father in heaven, we just thank you for the word today, Lord. We thank you for your messenger. We thank you for the power, Lord, that you that you delivered that word, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that all of us, Lord Jesus, myself included, Lord, that uh, we can stay, we can persevere, Lord. And we can persevere that even while we're on the job, while we're with different family members, Lord, while we're in this conversation or that conversation, that we can keep our identity rooted and grounded in you, Lord Jesus.